This is the fourth movie dealing with the mechanisms of contraction of striated muscle. In this movie, we will explore how various amounts of force can be generated by a muscle. I would like to begin by reminding you that motor neurons fire at high rates and thus always evoke a tetanic contraction in the muscle fiber that they innervate. Also recall that each muscle is composed of many muscle fibers. So if each fiber always contracts tetanically, how can the muscle generate various degrees of contraction? There are two major answers to this question. The first is that the various fibers are innervated by a different population of motor neurons. And the second is, each motor neuron can innervate a different number of muscle fibers. This figure shows a cross section of a spinal cord in the top left, together with a muscle and the muscle fibers that comprise it. Three motor neurons are shown in the lower part of the spinal cord, each with a different color. In this illustration, the muscle is innervated only by the three neurons. The three neurons therefore comprise the motor pool for this muscle, defined as the neuronal population that innervates the muscle. Those neurons will provide the entire innervation to that muscle and only to that muscle. Each motor neuron, however, will innervate a different set of muscle fibers. The purple motor neuron, for example, will innervate only one muscle fiber. The red motor neuron will innervate three other fibers, while the black motor neuron will innervate five fibers. Thus, each motor neuron innervates a unique set of fibers. The number of muscle fibers that are innervated by a motor neuron is called its motor unit. Thus, the purple motor neurons, which innervate only one fiber, has a motor unit size of one, while the red neuron, which has a motor unit size of three, and the black neuron has a motor unit size of five. You should also notice that while a motor neuron can innervate many muscle fibers, each muscle fiber is innervated by only one motor neuron. For example, the muscle fiber innervated by the purple motor neuron receives innervation from the purple motor neuron and not from any other motor neuron. Similarly, the muscle fiber indicated by the next arrow is innervated by the red motor neuron and only by the red motor neuron. Now the idea of a motor unit should be clear. Specifically, when a motor neuron fires, it always fires at a high rate. And thus, all of the fibers that are innervated by that neuron contract tetanically. In other words, they contract as a unit, hence the term motor unit. Now it should also be apparent why various degrees of contraction can be produced by progressively recruiting each motor neuron in the pool. For example, when both the red and black neurons are activated, they will cause a tetanic contraction of the muscle fibers that comprise the motor units of the red and the black motor neurons. Similarly, if all three motor neurons fire, all fibers in the muscle will contract tetanically, and the entire muscle will generate its maximal or tetanic force. To provide a more detailed view of the consequences of a progressive recruitment of motor neuron activity from the pool, imagine that the muscle shown in the upper portion of the slide is actually the biceps muscle, which is shown in the lower portion. Furthermore, imagine some of the muscle fibers, which you cannot see because they're not shown, are already activated by motor neurons in the pool, motor neurons that are also not shown. That activity is why the arm is partially flexed. Now we are going to recruit the purple, red, and black neurons in the pool and see how they influence the position of the arm. First, 
the purple motor neuron is recruited. That neuron only innervates one fiber, and thus the activation of that motor unit produces only a small increment in contraction. Next, we recruit the red fiber, which innervates three muscle fibers, and thus generates a somewhat larger contraction increment. Finally, we recruit the black fiber, which innervates five muscle fibers and produces an even larger increment in contraction. You can see the increments in contraction produced by the recruitment of the three motor neurons in the pool, which are also indicated by the size of the arrows. As a final point, the different motor unit sizes of the neurons in the pool endow the muscle with a moderate degree of motor control. Stated differently, increments in contraction raise from small, when the purple motor neuron is recruited, to a large increment when the black motor neuron is recruited, and an intermediate amount that can be imparted by the recruitment of the red neuron. Other muscles, however, are innervated by motor neurons that have only large motor units, neurons that only innervate many fibers. Muscles in your back or buttocks, for example, do not require fine control and thus have small motor neuron pools where each motor neuron innervates many fibers. Such a muscle is illustrated here. This muscle is innervated by only two motor neurons, and each motor neuron has a large motor unit size. Each has a motor unit size of five in this illustration. Activation of the purple motor neuron causes a large contraction, and recruitment of the black neuron then adds an equally large contraction. Of course, no muscle is actually innervated by only two motor neurons, but you get the point, which is that only large contraction increments can be generated in these muscles. Finally, there are muscles that are capable of very fine control. Examples are the muscles that control our fingers, our lips, and mouth and those that control our extraocular eye muscles, the muscles that move our eyes. These muscles have large motor neuron pools, and each motor neuron has a very, very small motor unit size, with sizes that can be as small as one, which means that each motor neuron innervates only one muscle fiber. In this illustration, the motor unit size of each motor neuron is two. What this imparts is a very fine control over muscle movement, since the recruitment of each motor neuron generates only a small contraction increment, as is illustrated here. So in summary, the control of contraction is dependent on the sizes of the motor units in the motor neuron pool. Muscles in which the motor unit sizes are large can only be coarsely controlled. Muscles that have a variety of motor unit sizes can be more finely controlled than the muscles with only large motor units, but not as finely as muscles in which the motor unit sizes are very small.